My mom, a long time ago, taught me to study history, and I hated history. I couldn't understand why I had to read Ben Franklin's autobiography one time, because that is the longest, most boring book I've ever read. But what I realized through those lessons of studying history is one thing never changed throughout history. Only one certainty that you can depend on and it's human nature. Human nature never changes. The universe around us, your mindset, your heart set, your hand set can all change around you, but human nature will never change. So I studied more history and I found something called Sanskrit. It's an ancient writing, before writing was writing. And it blew me away. And I put it on my phone and I sent it to everyone. I posted it up there. In this ancient Sanskrit, I found an interpretation, a translation of the 12 lessons for being human. Lessons that would teach us human nature so that we could raise our awareness to make life simple. Because that's what awareness does, right? I got tricked into meditating years ago because I told the lady that wanted me to meditate that meditation was a waste of time. I actually said, do you know who I am? Why would I meditate? I've married my dream girl, I have beautiful children, I have everything I ever dreamed of, not only multi-millions of dollars, but I have access to anything I want. Why would I meditate? And she said, because I can raise your awareness. I told her, not interested. I guess my awareness is fine. And then she said, well, I could raise your awareness when to buy or sell. Whoa. She hit me in the old day belts her heart. I mean, I could make more money? Yeah, that sounds good to me. That's why awareness became so important. So what I want to teach today are the 12 lessons of life based off of one simple thing, your nature and everyone else's around us that we can depend on. And if we depend on these lessons, and hopefully I'll give you a few strategies, some adherence to those strategies. Adherence is so important, right? It's great to have all these different habits that we want, but if you don't adhere to the positive thoughts and the positive actions and the positive intentions, you're not going to get anywhere. Adherence is a superpower. It's a super glue to create the change and maximize your potential of what? Your human nature. Now, lessons are interesting. The first lesson is my favorite because it changed my life. The first lesson read, you will receive a body. That's a deep statement. If that's a lesson of human nature, you will receive a body. That means that you existed before your body, but you also better take care of your body. In my life, as many of you, even last night, I heard through the questions you were asking, the natural human nature of feeling guilty that I was spending too much time making too much money, even though I spent my whole life trying to make too much money, and now my wife is pissed and doesn't appreciate what I did to make all that money, and I just want to spend time with my five-year-old at cheerleading camp, and so on, so on, so on. It happens every day. So what do we do? We decide, okay, I'll make a non-negotiable, my family, but then I'm going to lose out on the second non-negotiable of the activity I get paid for. I, there's, no, there's no work out there, by the way, guys. There's just activities. You get 24 hours of activity every day. Maximize it with productivity, efficiency, and statistical success, and I promise you, you will be considered more active than anyone else and more productive, more gracious and accessible than anyone you'll ever imagine, and most people just think you're busy. Different. I'm active. Extremely accessible, gracious, and productive. You will receive a body tells me that I had to re-engineer my non-negotiables to one thing, my health. So I decided, how do I take these great thoughts of human nature and put them into the pragmatic world? How do I reconcile the speed of thought, which moves so much faster than the speed of light? Speed of light is what your clock is based on, right? The time a little particle of light leaves the sun to get to the earth. That's how we determine 24 hours a day. It's about 186,000 seconds, uh, miles per second. It's pretty damn fast, but your thoughts move even faster than that. The number one non-negotiable is your health, so stick to a minimum, a minimum amount of time every day on your health. So I spend a minimum of an hour a day on my health. That is a priority of mine, a priority that's non-negotiable. 
I adhere to it. So if my son says, Dad, I want to play catch with you after I spend a minimum of an hour a day on my health or I incorporate the minimum of an hour of healthy exercise with him or whatever other creative or curious thing that I can do. But it's non-negotiable. Why? Because as you'll learn from these 12 lessons that I'm going to teach you about human nature and life, there's one simple truth. Is when you're healthy, you get as many wishes as you want. When you're healthy, you get as many wishes as you want, and you'll three, see through these lessons that your wishes are the most valuable thing that you have. See, the problem is if you don't learn that you have received a body and the importance of that body, you will be unhealthy. And when you're unhealthy, you only have one wish. That will teach you the significance of lesson number one. You will receive a body. The second lesson, you will learn lessons. Now we know our purpose. That's a really deep state statement. I love simplicity. As someone mentioned last night, Einstein always said, if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you don't understand it. You will learn lessons. That's why you're here. What does that mean? That means that pain, setbacks, failure, and mistakes are just indicators that you have a lesson to learn. But I'll tell you, it won't indicate you have a lesson to learn unless you have one of the greatest currencies that have ever been created, and that currency is called faith. People say, what are you talking about? Faith related to pain. It's directly related to pain. When you know that pain indicates, setbacks, failures, and mistakes indicate you have a lesson to learn, you need to have faith of two things. One, that you believe in something bigger than you. I don't care what religion, philosophy, spirituality you adhere to, you have to believe there's something bigger than you. All-knowing, all-powerful, omniscient being, you have to believe that if you want to understand these lessons. And two, most importantly, where faith is derived is not only I believe there's something bigger than me, but that which is bigger than me loves me even more than I love my own children. It changes your life because every time that there's a setback, a failure, or pain, I think about when I was three years old and I was on the beach for the first time and there was a bonfire and I ran towards it and I was about to reach into it because it looked warm. And my mom, as quickly as she could, the wonderful soul that she is, the gentle second grade teacher that still speaks to everybody like a second grade teacher, no matter how old or young you are, just slapped the shit out of my hands and said, no! And I started to cry, which I know a lot of you are like, you always cry, Dave. No, but I really cried this time. Yeah, I, I started to cry and I looked at him like, why are you punishing me? I had no idea. Why was she punishing me? She was protecting me. Just like you're being protected when you feel that pain. When that mistake, failure, setback, that business deal doesn't work out, you don't get the job that you wanted, you don't get what you want. Not only are you being protected, but you're being promoted. You're not being punished. When I lost everything, I shift my paradigm and understood this lesson that I was here to learn lessons and instead of feeling I was punished and going to blame, shame, justification, living in a world of liability, I took straight accountability and said, what am I supposed to learn? What did I do to attract this to myself? Because I want to be promoted and protected. I'm not going to put my attention and intention into what I don't want. So my ass is beeping. Thank you, Jake. I'm not taking pictures of you guys or this uh, DM thing. I do not know what happened here. Can someone come up here and take my phone? <laughs> this is great. I'm a professional. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Lesson number two. You will learn lessons. Great idea of putting your phone in the pocket in case the slides didn't work. All right, there we go. Uh, lesson number three. There are no mistakes. There's only lessons. You don't even 
Go, don't even go there that you made a mistake. There's no blame, shame, justification for you or anyone else. There's simply just lessons. And when you have faith, there's something bigger than you that loves you more than you love your own children, except for that which loves you knows everything. See, there's only two types of people, and we've seen them both here today. There's ignorant, arrogant people, and there's ignorant, humble people. Because all people are ignorant. You don't know what you don't know. One of the great things about technology and data that solidified this belief is there's trillions of data points out there. So how the F could I know what I know? There's too many variables. Unless you are Jim Quick times quick times quick, there's no way you could even handle one hundredth of the amount of variables that were there. That's not happening. But yet, there's tons of ignorant, arrogant people telling you to buy, telling you to sell, lying, manipulating, and cheating you. And I thought, man, I got to learn to identify all those people. But the scariest of all the ignorant, arrogant people, to be honest, are the ones that love us the most. I always say, Mom, you're the most ignorant, arrogant person in my life. And she takes it as an insult, of course. I said, what are you talking about? I said, because you love me so much, because you would rather receive the pain yourself than allow it to happen to me. Because you don't see pain as lessons, you see it as punishment, you protect me. Through ignorant arrogance, and you say things like, go to college, be a lawyer, right? All the things you don't know. My mom told me before I got involved with the internet, nine months out of law school, because I got involved with the internet, I was a millionaire. Nine months out of law school, my mom literally said, Dave, you better be a real lawyer because the internet's a fad. Don't come home asking me for money. I don't know how you're going to pay your law bills off. Just because someone loves you doesn't mean they give you good advice. Don't accept ignorant arrogance on both sides, manipulation, fear, anger, or those who love us too much. There's only mistakes. There are no mistakes. There's only lessons. The fourth one, one of my favorites, and we coaches in the world, we love this one because it makes us really rich. Um, a lesson will be repeated until it's learned. Anybody here ever feel stuck? <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's an indication you have a lesson to learn. Does anyone date this certain person and tell themselves, I'm never dating someone like that again, and then the exact same pe person is in your life? Coaches make a fortune off of you. You need adherence. You need to change the way you look at things so the things you look at change. you got to change your mindset, the way you think and see things, your heart set, the way you feel about them, and then the handset will follow what you think, say, do, and believe, all the activity that you put forth towards the mindset and the heart set. You will not, you will not learn a lesson. It will not, it will continue to be repeated until it's learned. And then you'll be amazed when you learn it how easy everything is. Right? The overnight success, 17 and a half years on average in a business, is a lot of lessons to have learned. So we should raise our awareness when lessons are being repeated, mistakes are being repeated. Number five, it's a message of limitlessness infinity. I know in my introduction, and I adore Cole, but I keep on having to tell him, I'm not here to empower a billion people. I'm here to empower over a billion people. Don't limit, limit me, Cole. Over, man. I hate people. I'm going to make a million dollars by the end of the year. I'm like, no, you're not. Make over a million dollars. Why are you limiting yourself? I still do it. I share my Lakers seats with Diane Cannon. She's an old actress uh, that was married to Cary Grant. And she, I told her I, I was born on January 11th at 111 and that I was going to die at 111 on January 11th at 111. And she had this sad look on her face. I was like, what's the matter, Diane? She goes, it's so sad. I'm like, what? She goes, why are you limiting yourself? She was the first person that ever said that to me. She said, 
With the way technology is going, Dave, probably they'll have some DNA stem cells, something that'll make the average age of a human being a thousand years. And I just would hate for you to continually speak out into the universe that you want to die at 111, at uh, January 11th at 111. You're going to be taken off 889 years of your life because you think you know what you know. Stop limiting yourself. Think about guys like Bezos, man. I think about him all the time because I am a dreamer. I'm an optimist. I'm a toptimist. I think beyond what I think beyond. And that's why I thought I got what I got because I could think past what other people would think about. My reality surpassed other people's imagination. And I think about 25 years ago hanging out with Bezos in his garage. And at that time, I was way richer than he was. I was more famous than he was. I had more access than he had, more relationships in Silicon Valley than he did. And if he turned to me in that garage when he was selling books and said, Dave, not only am I going to be richer than you, but I'm going to be the richest man on earth. I'm going to make a trillion dollars. Now, I try not to limit myself or other people's belief, but let's be honest. I would have laughed, scoffed at him, maybe even made fun of him. Now we applaud him. And I applaud him, just the same way that I've learned in my life when people laugh at me, scoff at me, and make fun of me, they're ignorant and arrogant. They don't know. How the hell could they know what I'm capable of when there's only one omniscient, all-powerful source that cares about me more than my own mom cares about me and more than I care about my children? How the hell could they know what I'm capable of? Because I don't even know. But I do know one thing, I'm not going to limit myself. So I'm going to say I'm going to make over I put speed into everything. It's not by this date because the problem with putting a date or an amount on something is every minute, second, and molecule that goes by, it creates more and more resistance because you get closer and closer to that time and amount without being there. And that's a natural force of energy. So you have to think over it. Be unlimited in your thinking. Tell yourself, I'm going to make as much money as I can as fast as I can. That's what you want to do. I hear it all the time, and people think it's counterintuitive. You mean you don't have goals? Oh, I have goals. I have five daily practices that determine those goals. Every day I take inventory of my objectives. Every day, not being afraid of being a hypocrite, not being afraid to change my mind, not being to tell, afraid to tell people, I don't know what the heck I don't know. But I'm doing my best. I'm learning lessons, and I'm having fun. You want to join me? Because we can do that together a lot easier. I'm doing my best, I'm learning lessons and having fun. That's all you need to do. Because the learning of lessons does not end. That's why the unlimitlessness, this life of infinity is so hard to fathom because the lessons don't end and neither do you. Lesson number six. There is no better than here. One of the biggest and most resistant creating things on earth is we take our emotions and we attach them to there. It's terrible. You're creating resistance for yourself. Where do you want to attach your emotions, your energy and motion? Not to, what, to there, but to here. What do I mean by that? I'll tell you. If you appreciate one of the greatest emotions ever created, one of the higher truths of the universe, a high frequency idea, a frequency that will actually allow you to be the most that you can be, when you appreciate what you have here, right now, at the right place at the perfect time, I call it the law of gravity because the world's spinning and hurling and moving at such a great speed, but you guys are just sitting there without any movement. There must be something that tells me we're at the right place at the perfect time and that here is better than there. But when I appreciate here, my here grows. Why? What's appreciation? You guys are real estate people, most of you. If your house appreciates, that's a good thing. It means it went up in value, expands, right? So let's learn to appreciate here first. See, when you appreciate something, it grows and expands, then you can acknowledge it. We only can acknowledge something when it's given away or taken away, when we don't have it anymore, when we acquire the knowledge. So what we want to do is appreciate here, 
have it grow and then give it away. Before it may be taken away, just give it away. What remains? A bigger vessel, a bigger space. And this is where most people fall down with faith. I talked about it for like a two-second period last night. I said, most frustrating thing that drives me nuts is people don't like to ask for help. They don't wish. They don't wish, but yet when we, I mean, I work with the biggest athletes in the world, and I got to do something called the Make-A-Wish Foundation with Troy Aikman, Steve Young, Warren Moon, several different athletes that I've been able to do that with. And I can't tell you, these guys who get paid millions of dollars, there's no better feeling than they were, what? Delivering a wish. So why is it that almost every one of you are afraid to ask for help and let somebody else feel that way? The way that you feel when you're helping someone else, when you're able to deliver a wish, food, water, air, whatever it is that you're delivering, why do we deny each other? Because we forget the third component of appreciation, acknowledgement, and it's asking. See, when we ask, we now have a bigger void to fill, more than a billion people to empower, not just a billion people. I tried to explain this to my mom, too, because my mom's almost 80. And she gave her life away, mostly to her children in her community. Her entire life, nothing was for her. She appreciated everything she had. And she acknowledged everything she had continually, giving it away, giving it away. So she would appreciate it and give it away, but never ask for more. And here, a lifetime goes by of aggregate effect. And where do our parents who are selfless and unconditional with their love that live for their children in their community, where do they end up? Without their health, without their wealth, without their worthiness, without their happiness, because they gave it all away and never asked for more. Because they didn't realize that they had somebody that knew way more than them, that loved them more than she loved me. Thousands of years ago, they wrote this shit. It's more applicable day than ever. There is not better than here. Appreciate, acknowledge, and ask for more. I promise you, here will be better than there all the time. Seven. Others are merely mirrors of you. This one's hard to take. This was the first red flag in my life that I was going to lose everything. It happened six years before I lost everything. When I was 30 years old, I had married my dream girl in the fourth grade. My best friend, Rob, had asked her to go study at sixth grade camp. He embarrassed me. He's like, dude, she said no. So I got home. She lived down the block from me. I threw an egg at her, hit her in the back of the head. But I was blessed. I was a multimillionaire at that time running Samsung's phone division. I had tons of real estate. And uh, my father and I uh, hadn't spoken in, in close to 20 years. He had left when I was five. But when I was 10, he forgot my birthday. I know some of you have heard this story, but it's, to me, a significant one to teach this lesson. And he... Um, at 10, he forgot my birthday, and, and that was pretty hard to take because at that time, he was my hero, even though he left my mom. In fact, one of the things I had to work through guilt-wise was I would sit in a country squire station wagon when my mom packed my dinner in a paper bag as she worked two jobs, second grade teacher filling up turnstiles at 7-Elevens with greeting cards just so I could eat, and I'd ask my mom, why aren't you more like dad? Meanwhile, my dad was a 70s deadbeat dad that wasn't giving any child support wasn't helping my mom. But at 10 years old, my dad made that mistake. And here's the bigger mistake he made. When I went to him crying, saying, Dad, how could you forget my birthday, my 10th birthday? He said, I didn't forget your birthday. I don't believe in birthdays. At 10 years old, I immediately said, I hate you. So I knew he was a liar a cheater, a manipulator, an overseller, a back-end seller, and I wanted nothing to do with him. But now here I was, 30, in what I thought was pure happiness. No longer was I a victim. Nothing was happening to me. 
Most things were happening for me in my life. I was buying things I didn't need to impress people I didn't like. But in that world of for me, my dad bought me a gift my 30th birthday. A huge box came. I opened it up. It was a beautiful blazer. And when I opened up the blazer, I started to cry. Like, oh, my God, I'm looking to see is especially made for my son's birthday or Armani or something because it fit perfectly. I thought, wow, my dad finally gets it. I'm going to have a relationship with him. I, you know. 30 years old, I thought I had everything, but I realized what I was missing most. And I looked at the jacket, he tore out all the pockets in my jacket. I wish I was ready to understand what he was trying to tell me, but I wasn't. So I called him and I said, Dad, why are you punishing me? He said, I'm not punishing you. I want you to learn a lesson that I didn't learn, that money doesn't buy love or happiness. You don't want to be the richest man in the cemetery. There is better than here. You don't want to keep everything and accumulate it. You become a prisoner of accumulation because you then have what you accumulate. You have to either sell it, buy it, insure it, give it away. You're a prisoner to accumulation. That's why we acknowledge it by giving it away and just ask for more. Mathematically, it's much better. But I wasn't ready to listen to him, and I told him straight out, I hate you. I'm nothing like you. You're a liar, a cheater, a manipulator, an overseller, and a back-end seller. Six years later, that jacket would save my life. That jacket has saved my life. Because six years later, I came home from the Grammy Awards with little John, after lying, cheating, manipulating, overselling, and back end selling my wife, wasted. And I walked in the door six years later. I now was running Lee Steinberg Sports and Entertainment, that notable sports agency that they made that small movie about. So not only was I super rich, but I had access to everything I wanted the cabins at the Masters, sidelines, locker rooms, anything I wanted, plus the money. So I came home which was a more frequent occurrence. And there was my wife, my dream girl from the fourth grade, my whole life, to tell me that she was leaving me. She wasn't happy. And that I'd better take stock in who I was and what I wanted to become, or I was going to end up dead. I wish I was ready to hear her that morning, but I wasn't. And the next morning, I was even more not ready to hear her because all I could think about was how I was going to take her happiness, how I was going to take her money. Completely lost, completely lonely, completely unhappy, not appreciating or acknowledging or asking, not appreciating, taking for granted for everything, not only what other people were wishing for, but I took for granted what I had wished for. And I sat there enraged, thinking, man, I hate her. I can't believe she's doing this to me. Look around. Look at the cars, the, the ski mountain, the golf course. Look at everything. Are you kidding me? She had nothing when I met, right? Some of you may have heard conversations like this or had them with yourself. And I looked in the closet, and there was that jacket. Man, others are merely mirrors of you. I looked at that jacket, and I said, I don't hate my wife. I don't hate my father. I hated myself. I was a liar, a cheater, a manipulator, an overseller, and a back-end seller. So next time you have a need to be offended, resentful, guilty, angry, anxious, frustrated, some ego-based consciousness that's triggering you to accelerate in the wrong direction, to focus attention and attention on what you don't want, what's missing, or what other people want for you, just remember, others are a mirror of you. I'm just here to learn these lessons. Number eight, what you make of your life is up to you. I interviewed Ray Lewis, and one of his great lines to me, I told him, I said, dude, you are not the best, strongest, talented linebacker, but yet, the strongest, fastest, most talented linebacker, but yet you're the best linebacker that's ever played. Why is that? And he leaned over and he grabbed my leg and he said, because when I step on the field, I'm willing to die. And he freaking meant it. What you make of your life is up to you. There's only effort 
your effort and your effort and you. There's only you. You can't give what you don't have. That's why you have to ask. You can't give what you don't have. Your life is up to you, so take control of your mindset, your heart set, and your hand set. So many people out there have FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. They got FOPO, even worse, fear of other people's opinion. One of the other great historical researches that I read is one of my favorite books. It's called, it's by Sesame Street. It's called The, the Monster at the End of the Book. Anybody remember that? Any old people there? Yeah, Grover, it's Grover's book. So Grover, at the beginning of the book, he says, hey, welcome to the book. Just so you know, there's a monster at the end of this book, so do not turn the page. And so, of course, I turned the page. And there he was, super bummed out again. Dude, I told you, don't turn the page. There's a monster at the end of this book. I don't trust you anymore, so I'm going to nail the page. And, you know, this is back in the 60s or 70s, so they actually showed just a picture of someone with wood hammering up the page. But, of course, I turned the page. And guess who was there waiting for me? Grover, please, I don't think you understand. There's a monster at the end of the book. So he bricks it up and he cements it up again and again. And then finally, he warns me, he goes, we're almost at the end of the book. Please don't turn the page. So I turned the page and there he was. Lovable, cuddly Grover. You, that's all. You're the monster at the end of your book. Keep turning the page. Those are just lessons. Just turn the page. Don't listen to the FOMO and the FOPO, people telling you what you can't do, what will never happen. They don't know. They're ignorant and either humble or arrogant. You make what your life, it's up to you. Nine is about gratitude. Nine is life is exactly what you think it is. You cannot find outside of you what you can't find inside of you. Gratitude is the superpower to find the light, the love, and the lessons in everything. See, there's light, there's love, and lessons in everyone, every place, every situation, every game, anything that you want. There's life, love, and lessons in it. The only real decision you need to make is on what part of the spectrum does it feed or bleed you? in order to find the light, the love, and the lessons. Let me give you a quick analogy. If we all went to a, the Del Mar Fair in San Diego, for example, and they have the food court row with, you know, fried Snickers, uh, chocolate fried Snickers this, and those homemade potato chips or the big turkey leg or whatever, and you're walking down looking at the food, there'd be a portion of us at each of the different stands that would say, oh, my God, I love that. Or that looks so good, even if they've never even tried it. And then there'd be another portion that would be like, oh, I'm barfed in my mouth just thinking about it, right? This is horrible. Why is that? Because there's light, love, and lessons in everything. We have to choose how to spend our activity. And here's on the business side what happens beyond the personal side. 80% of your time is spent on things that bleed you. Think about that for a second. 80%, even the biggest companies in the world, I consult with Gulf Oil, they had a client that was $20 million, and he was, the chairman was telling me, hey, Dave, can you help me? Like, we're spending a lot of resources over here on this client, but I think they have a lot of potential. But they're bleeding us, man. It's just high maintenance. It, you know, it costs us so much right now. I said, well, who's your biggest client? So we got a $4 billion client that's been here since the beginning. We don't have to do anything. I mean, they, they just send in the orders. It's, you know, they're so, I mean, it's like family. I said, oh, okay, fire the $20 million client today. Yeah, but the potential, I mean, there's no potential there. Because if you take the resources on the $20 million client, put it over here on the $4 billion client who doesn't need your help, you'll turn that $4 billion client into an $8 billion client a lot faster than you'll send and turn a $20 million into a $40 million. We do that with so many different things in our lives, people, places, things, and time. 
We spend 80% of our times on things that bleed us because we don't understand the spectrum of bleeding and feeding. We don't do that quick analysis and say, is it worth the time it's going to take and what result am I going to get? And we do that with relationships. We do that with sleep. One of the other biggest pet peeves of my life, this one blows me away. Majority of the people on earth go to sleep at night. And they wake up more tired than when they went to bed. How stupid are we? How obvious is that of how important sleep is to you? You only have four necessities. If you focus in on the four necessities, everything else will come your way. Nutrients. That means spend 80% of your time with things that feed you, not bleed you. Two, water. You got to stay hydrated because you're a conduit to that great source of power, light, and lessons that loves you more than your parents love you. Three, air. Learn to breathe. I know Natasha talked a little bit about that. You got to learn to breathe, to stop, drop, and roll, to not accelerate in the wrong direction, but breathe through your nose, out through the mouth, to find your center, your neutral, to be in the flow. And then four, sleep. You can't live unless you sleep. Imagine if we all went out to dinner tonight, on me, by the way, and I said, eat as much as you can, drink as much as you can, Except for Cody. Um, And you even have dessert on me. And we have two hours to get whatever we want. And after the two hours, we all walk out of the restaurant and everyone looks at each other and says, man, I'm hungry. Would there be something wrong with that? Would we question what we just did for two hours? Why are you not questioning what you did for the last six to eight hours of your life? Every single goddamn day. Why is it we don't look at it? I have a sleep coach. It's the number one coach that I have. Making sure that I have all four nutrients that are all intertwined with each other, including my sleep. You got to eat certain things, drink certain things, breathe a certain way. The air temperature has to be a certain way. In order to what? Recover quickly and access the uninterfered, unego consciousness that exists while we sleep that allows us to access information, then your meditation or your period of quiet means something because you can transcend the information from the all-knowing, all-powerful into the real world. Life's exactly what you think it is. Ten, your answers lie inside of you. I briefly mentioned you give meaning to everything you see. When we start looking at what triggers us, what bleeds us, and it can be uh, people, we we call those people family. (laughs) When we determine we need to get into the practice of identifying what bleeds us, what triggers us. And so I've created a list for myself what lies inside of me. Because I have a quantum nature that has genetically and energetically been inherited. So I can look to my grandfather, great-grandfather. I can look to past lives, whatever you believe in. And I can say, man, there seems to be an energetic or genetic quantum being that I am. This is what lies inside of me. I have the need to be right. I wish I had the time, emotion, and money back from all the time, emotion, and money I've spent on the need to be right. People ask me all the time, how the hell did you lose $100 million? You know why? I didn't need to be right. That's it. I didn't need to be right. Usually followed by a need to be offended, resentful, angry, anxious, frustrated. How about worried? Anybody ever worry? Imagine if you could take all the time, emotion, and money we wasted on worrying, and we all give it to charity. Probably everybody on earth would eat the way that we were talking about for the two hours we were talking about. That's how much we worry. What's worrying is probably one of the dumber things we do because not only is it an interference, right? Not only is it ego-based consciousness that is destructing us, it is dis-ease, it's bleeding us, but it also, in its effect, is wishing for what we don't want, right? We, I know Cole said this about his daughter winning the trophy in first place championship, right? Exactly. He's speaking it into his existence. So when you're about to take a law test and say, please don't have the rules of perpetuity on it. Please don't have the rules of perpetuity on it. I spent more times worrying about the rules of perpetuity than learning it. And guess what the first question on the goddamn test was? Of course it was. 
The answers lie inside of you. Learn the triggers of the ego, and when you identify them, now we're into a race. We're into a race to determine how long is it going to take until I can get back to center so I can start feeding myself again instead of bleeding myself, moving in the right direction. How can I do this? Don't resist it. Don't go over it. Don't go under it. Don't go through it. Don't go around it. Don't oversell it. Back and sell it. Lie to it. Cheat to it. Manipulate it. Simply stop. Stop. Breathe. Put yourself back into center and then roll in the right direction for what you want, who you can help, who can help you, how to get it done, prioritizing what's important to you and applying your why, not searching for there where the why is. Apply your why. It's right here, not there. Remember, the answers lie inside of you. Lesson 11, one of my faves and you know, this has all been simplified, narrowed down. This is hours and hours and hours of research of Sanskrit and history and transcriptions and transformations. And, but number 11, when I finally came to it, I loved it. You will forget all of this. Forget all of this. Yeah. So if you're gonna get a takeaway from today for those that are writing notes, which I think is a great thing, or taking notes on anything that you're doing, if you're doing that, that's terrific. But take it from the old middle-aged mutant turtle in front of you, right? I got books and books and books and books and books and books and books, and I'm not exaggerating, of notes. And I have no way to access what's in them. So if you're gonna take the time to know that you're going to forget all of this, so you're going to codify it somewhere. Also create a searchable repository. Luckily for us, we have this great thing, this technology now that allows us to search almost everything. I have my own goddamn search engine for this purpose because I have so many stupid movies and content or whatever. It's, people are like, where's that video of this? I'm like, I got to build a search engine. Keyword, be kind to your future self and find all the videos yourself and watch them. But think about it. You're going to forget everything. The biggest thing that we forget, gratitude. You saw it in the video. I don't need to go back over it. Another remarkable stupidity of human nature. I forget gratitude. I forget it. But I have systems in place to understand that speed I'm talking about, that I only spend minutes and moments today in ego-based consciousness. I only spend minutes and moments outside of where I want to be. I only spend minutes and moments not feeding myself. And it aggregates upon itself, it compounds on itself, and it just becomes an amazing life living between limitlessness and infinity. The last lesson, number 12. You can remember these lessons whenever you want, even ones you don't know. So powerful. In order to do that, you got to have faith that you have the ability to access the all-knowing, the all-powerful, the omniscient at any time, knowing that it's protecting and promoting us, knowing that it loves us more than we love our own children or our parents love us, knowing that with faith, only spending minutes and moments outside of that faith, but the majority of our time feeding from that source to allow it to come through us with appreciation to expand it, acknowledgement to give it away, and then we can ask it for more. You can, you can access it. You can remember it whenever you want, even things you don't know, but you got to be able to wish. you got to be able to ask and dream. Take the imagination, make it a possibility, a mathematical advantage over nothing, a possibility to a probability requires the in-spirit, the inspiration. Another mathematical example. You just think of what you want. It's a possibility. You get inspired. It's a probability. And then use this strategy, discipline, and these lessons to get out of your own way and make it your perspective, your reality. Simple lessons of human nature. Simple lessons of humankind. If anybody wants those lessons, feel free. They're on the internet. You can email me. I don't care. I'm happy to send them to you. I have notes on them if you want to repository them and search them. 
Remember, recollect, and remind yourself that you are healthy, you are wealthy, you are worthy, and you are happy. Let's all figure out with these lessons what's interfering with it. You don't got to go get it. I'm David Meltzer. I'm extremely grateful. God bless all of you. Thank you.